If this goes on, don't panic. Bringing hope to the world through speculative fiction. And welcome to If This Goes On, Don't Panic. In this episode, we have author Susan Palumbo, and we also have Hugo winning podcaster Amy Sally. Yay! And so Amy is going to be our guest co host today because my regular co host, one needs a mental health break, and the other one is still in Spain. Lucky. So jealous. Actually, I'm kind of jealous of both of them. <laughs> I know, I could use a mental health break, really. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. I I have one coming soon and I am so looking forward to it. I've been like a ball of anxiety for about nine months now and I'm ready for it to be over. (laughs) Oh, buddy, we got to get you a nice padded room, a little, a grippy sock vacation. Yes. You are not kidding. You're not kidding. I am almost there. Thank God for therapy, right? (laughs) (laughs) For real. (laughs) So uh, Amy, before we go on too much further, let's introduce you. Amy is a longtime sci-fi and fantasy fan. She cut her teeth on teen urban fantasy, including a dubious foray into vampire LARPing in her youth. Oh, that's interesting. (laughs) And Star Trek TNG and never looked back. In fact, her teenage commitment to one day wooing Wesley Crusher is probably how we got where we are today. Amy is fiercely committed to converting all of her friends to the truth of nerdy pop culture, including, but not limited to, forcing them all to listen to her podcast, which is Hugo Girl. And you, <laughs> you got to say it with more sass. You got to say it with more sass than that. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. And your podcast is Hugo Girl. There you go. <laughs> which just won a Hugo Award. Woo! That's amazing. I know. It's incredible. It's incredible. So what was that like? Oh my gosh. Well, I was a ball of squishy nerves leading up to it. And all of our friends, we, we all gathered together in the same living room at 7 a.m. to watch the awards because they were in China. Mm-hmm. And I cannot explain to you the joy and happiness in that room when they announced our name. Like it was just such a, it was just such a wonderful, wonderful moment. And I just feel so proud of all the people that I, that I do this podcast with Lori, Haley and Kevin. Like it's just, it's just a really nice validation of a lot of hard work. So, and it's a really, really nice to know that the community out there likes it. That's awesome. That's so awesome. I, I, Lori sent me a video of your celebration of the announcement and the celebration. I guess, it looked like Kevin maybe maybe took the video. <laughs> it was awesome. Uh, no, that was uh, that was my boyfriend. That was my boyfriend Zach. But he he was like, I got no skin in this game. I'm just going to focus the phone. <laughs> and I didn't even know he was doing it, but I was so glad he captured it because I, I it's all kind of a blur. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I bet. Did you all have to do like a thank you speech or how did that work? Yeah, we sent in. So I think all the nominees were asked to send in if they weren't going to be present to send in a video, an acceptance video, just in case. And so when they announced us, and it was really wild because the Hugo Awards in China were like on this hu- in this huge auditorium on this huge stage, like they were the Oscars. Yes. And so they, they announced our name and then they played our acceptance video to this huge room. So our faces were like, I don't know, story tall. Or something wow. Like so yeah, we sent, we sent in a video ahead of time and you can find that video and our outtake video, I believe on our Instagram. That's that's super awesome. I, I've talked to Neil Clark about that before because he's been to China for multiple conferences because of the work that he does with Chinese authors. And he says there, it's like it's like the Emmys or something. Like there's like giant red carpet, everybody wears tuxedos. It's like this huge big deal. It was wild. Watching that ceremony was wild. And that's who I think he was the one who announced us actually. Neil Clark. Oh, really? That's so cool. That's so cool. I got to hang out with him last year after he won his award. So that was pretty neat. Oh my God. That was such a good moment. Yeah, totally. Totally. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm so excited to have you as a co-host. That's amazeballs. Back in the day when I started podcasting science fiction, I never thought I'd have friends who actually won Hugos and stuff. So it's so cool. (laughs) I never thought I'd have anybody that wanted to listen to my podcast. (laughs) Right? Right? Your achievement is awesome. And I'm I'm so happy to have you here. Oh, thanks, buddy. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for asking me. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just wanted to say a couple of quick things before we get to our amazing guest today. 
it's been a while since I like reminded everybody where we exist. So I just wanted to say real quick, if if you're not sure where to find us in the uh, social media world, you can find us on Blue Sky. I'm actually mostly a Blue Sky these days. We do have an account on Twitter or X or whatever the hell it's called now. I don't go there very much. There's a couple of people I keep in contact with there. But so I do put out the podcast there. We also have a Facebook account that I check more more frequently than the Twitter account, but not much more frequently. We also have an Instagram account, which I just started, and there's not much there yet, but I'm planning hmm, to maybe do some fun little videos there. We'll see. And we also have a YouTube account. So there's no video on the YouTube account, but if you like YouTube and you use it a lot and you want to listen to the podcast, you can find us there too. We have a a few subscribers there. It's not our main place, but some people do listen to us there. So you can check that out too. That's all in the business domain. I think we're ready for our guest. Woo! When we come back, we will have Susan Palumbo with us. And we are back. Today, our guest is Susan Palumbo. Susan Palumbo is a Trinidadian Canadian dark speculative fiction writer and editor. Her short stories have been nominated for the Nebula, Aurora, and World Fantasy Awards. She's also the co founder of the Ignite Awards with L.D. Lewis. Her debut dark fantasy slash horror short story collection, Skin Thief Stories, Skin Thief colon, Stories, is out now from Neon Hemlock. And her novella, Countess, will be published by ECW Press in 2024. Her writing has been published in Lightspeed Magazine, Fantasy, The Deadlands, The Dark Magazine, Pseudopod, Fireside Fiction Quarterly, Podcastle, Anathema, Specfic, From the Margins, and other venues. She can be found on Instagram at Gothic Syntax. When she isn't writing, she can be found sketching, listening to New Wave, or wandering her local misty forests. <laughs> so welcome, Susan. Hello. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on and being part of our horror mini-series that we're doing. I'm here for horror anywhere. You call me for horror, I'll show up. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah, we've been doing like a, I guess, unintentionally a three-parter. I kind of just you know, book things as it goes. But I went to StokerCon over the summer and it kind of, you know, ignited my interest in horror again. But I started out as a horror fan and, and then got away from it. And so we've been really trying to talk to people, you know, about horror and to do some exploration of the topic because we've not really had too many horror authors on here before. But before we get into horror too much, I want to start with Hope Punk. And so the reason I asked you to come on is because you had some opinions about Hope Punk. And while I am not a huge fan of naming conventions and categories and all that sort of thing, we do kind of loosely consider ourselves to be Hope Punk in a lot of ways, or at least in our guiding principles anyway. So I want to talk with you about that first, and then maybe we can get into the horror stuff. Sure. I'm hopeful about it. I'm feeling hope right now. <laughs> Well, excellent. I'm glad. <laughs> when Kat and I decided to start the podcast, you know, we were very interested in politics. Well, we're still very interested in politics, but also like talking about politics in science fiction and fantasy and now horror as well from like a political lens, right? And 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 talking about those topics with the people who actually write them, right? And at the time we started the podcast, it was, you know, we felt like we needed to you know, try to put some hope out into the world for other people because we felt like we were missing so much of it ourselves. So I guess that's why we consider ourselves to be Hope Punk. Susan, why don't you give us your opinion on Hope Punk and, and talk about that a little bit? Okay, so first of all, as you said, you define yourself as Hope Punk. So I'm not really sure what that means to you before I speak on it. So if you could give me like a sentence or two, it's yeah, the interview has switched now. I am interviewing you. And <laughs> we have come to the point where I would like in a sentence or two, what does hope punk mean to you in this podcast? And then I'll riff off of that. Okay. Well, first I want to welcome our new co-host, Susan Palumbo. Thank you for joining us, Susan Palumbo. No, um, you know, I, the focus for me is on, on the punk part, really, you know, I, was a punk, you know what I mean? Like literally a punk musician with the mohawk and you know, all that shit in the early aughts, you know, I did a lot of that. And I've always been really into politics, like I've already mentioned. And so for me, hope punk is kind of 
pushing the boundaries of of whatever you're doing, really, in hope that you know you will make changes to the world for the better. And and, and the better, in my opinion, is to a more progressive world, a more diverse world, a more accepting world, a less violent world, a world where people can live more peacefully and and you know live live to their their best ability basically does that make sense of course and maybe i'll let amy say what she thinks as well guys this is a whole new concept to me i'm not gonna lie to you right now i'm riveted by this discussion because (laughs) i've never talked about this before so i don't personally i mean i don't have a definition of hope punk although the two words together make a very compelling portmanteau for you know fringe approaches to a hopeful future right Mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense definition wise okay so what i get i got got that so my my opinion of hope punk is and i think a personal definitions uh, are are different than what genre definitions are and the way people sort of conceptualize something so obviously what one person perceives as hopeful and punk another person may have a completely different version of what is hopeful to them and what is punk to them because everything is sort of on a sliding scale, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like what one person finds hope from isn't always the same as what another person would find hope from because if we're, as you've mentioned in your definition, if we're moving towards a diverse world, right, a more diverse world, then what hope looks like should be diverse as well, if we're going with that definition. And so I like the aspirational underpinning of the idea that, you know, we want to move towards a world that is less violent or more accepting of diversity. And I think you asked me here because I have some very strong opinions about how hope punk is deployed Mm -hmm. rather than the concept of hope punk existing on its own. I'm I'm okay with the the idea of hope punk and it existing. It's sometimes how it's deployed that I kind of get a little bit edgy about. So I don't have a specific definition of what it is in terms of like a dictionary definition. I just have my sort of pushing against it ideas. Does that make sense? It's kind of like how the Supreme Court defined porn, which is you cannot define it. You just know it when you see it. Is it kind of like that? <laughs> I feel so. I, I kind of I, I don't want to go off on a rant. Am I so am I OK to go off on a rant? Because it's a complicated <laughs> subject for me. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Off on a rant. I mean, and I can't remember exactly what you said because it was on Twitter or Blue Sky. I can't even remember what we are on at that point. I know what I said. I said horror is more hope punk than hope punk. <laughs> And I love that. I, I want you to. I want you to explain that. Okay. And this is again my personal view, and I'm not trying to cut down anybody else's personal view or or whatever sure. what what they have. I the way I experience hope punk is actually not very freeing in my little niche where where I write. I I often find it quite constricting because what it feels like to me is that I am being sort of asked to write a story where everything comes out good in the end. And my worldview, because of who I am, because of the things I face, because of where I was born and brought up, it doesn't fit into that. And so when I try to write something that would seem to fit in the hope punk genre, it feels like I'm lying to myself, or it feels like I am sort of covering up the truth of my lived experience. And so it's funny when I started writing, I didn't think that I was writing dark things. I was just writing things that reflected my life. But when I started getting published and when I started getting published and read by people in Canada and in the United States, they they came to me and they said, Susan, these things are really horrific, <laughs> what you're writing about. And to me, It was just me writing. It was emotional. I thought the stuff I was writing was emotional. But they were like, no, this is horror. And I was like, oh, really? You know, this writing, this process of writing these things, of these dark things for me, was hopeful. To me, the experience of sort of putting them down on paper, facing them, 
And then still being there at the end, the reader has gone through that sort of cathartic journey with me. And I have survived that cathartic journey myself. And so at the end of reading something quite dark, I feel very hopeful as opposed to reading something that, okay, I know they're going to win in the end. To me, that isn't reflective of my experience. So it doesn't necessarily fill me with hope. Mm -hmm. Susan, that's so interesting because when I was reading your stories in Skin Thief, I think I might eat my words later, but I'm pretty sure <laughs> every single one of the stories, when I got to the end of it, I felt like it was a happy ending <laughs> in a way, right? Because life is not sunshine and roses, right? Life is going through trauma and seeing how you come out on the other side and doing your best to come out as whole as possible on the other side. And often you're changed and often you don't recognize yourself anymore, but that can also be a good thing sometimes. So it's interesting that I, I can't, I'm not surprised that people would react to your stories in a way that's like, oh my gosh, this is so dark. This is so depressing. This is so everything. But I, it's really interesting because I read them as, as hopeful. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I've got a lot, lot to say in response to that. I mean, I, I pretty much totally agree with you. Let me just say that out front because I think for me, the hope is kind of in the punk. Like punk is about pushing back. It's about the act of pushing back. Mm-hmm. It's not about everything's going to be happy forever. Amen. You know what I mean? It's it's about figuring out how to make things better and then doing it. The action of doing the pushing back to me. And that's that's kind of like why I say like my focus is on the punk part because it's good to have hope, but also I think the pushing back creates hope, you know, for, for those of us who don't like where things are or, you know, or don't like where things are going necessarily. And they kind of feed into each other. Well, I think that's good because in any situation, like a foregone conclusion seems like the opposite of hope to me, right? So anytime you want to push back against something that's the status quo or something like that, I think that's an inherently hopeful thing to do. Yeah. Otherwise, why would if you didn't think it could be changed, why would you bother? Right. Right. So, yeah. But I, I totally see what you're saying, Susan, because I totally think that it can be marketed that way sometimes. And and OK, now I'm going to get up on a soapbox a little bit <laughs> <laughs> like. It's like anything, any genre or subgenre that has the word punk in it, the punk kind of gets stomped to death. And in, in the first part is the part that seems to matter. You know what I mean? Like cyberpunk or you know what i mean like the punk part gets stomped to death and then and it ceases to exist you know what i mean and it's just like this it's like watergate now every every scandal is gate you know what i mean it's dumb it loses its meaning you know but but it shouldn't because that in my opinion like i said is the operative word right but go ahead susan i i I know you were going to say something and i interrupted you i'll get off my soapbox now (laughs) you can i mean it's it's your podcast soapbox you can can (laughs) stand on it anytime i'd rather the guests talk more than me believe me <laughs> there there's that there's that idea right the cat the categorization of genre but there's also but it's very interesting because you know it's theory and practice right and it's okay so we're discussing it here but then and then my other part is well how is it deployed right and this and this is the part where it concerns me a lot as a whore, as a person who leans horror. Next year, I have a space opera coming out, so I can't keep saying I'm a horror writer all the time because I, I wrote this space opera. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, it is. Let me tell you, <laughs> <laughs> I was reading it today, and I was like, "This is not." Bad. <laughs> Oh, I was just reading an interview where you talked about how writing sci-fi was so hard for you. So this is exciting. I love this. Yeah, it it it, it what it is, but I've I'm, I've broken through. I've been hopeful about. Look at you. You're you're like one of your own stories. <laughs> yes, I'm break, I'm fighting against it. So what what concerns me often is the practice, and we're in. It's not just we're we're not just writing in a vacuum. We're not just sitting there and discussing this. We have readers, and we have people who do critique, and we have feedback, and we have we have magazines who who just stories and they they you know everyone can say that we're we are very you know open-minded and diverse but they have their tastes and they have their type of of stories that they like to publish and so you know people have their biases and i i feel like as a horror writer often what happens is there is this sort of morality attached to 
writing a story where we have a protagonist who has a very hopeful outlook on life, or we have moral weight put on things like actions that happen in a story. And I've noticed a trend, and I'm not saying everybody is doing this, where people want to attach that morality to the writer, or they want to say, okay, well, I write hopeful stories, so that's a nice person. This person <laughs> will do good things. You know, they're an ally. And, or this person, you're writing horror, and those are dark things. How could you put that out into the world? Because, like, as you referenced, we wanted to put out hopeful things into the world, right? So that would hopefully uplift people's spirits or give them hope to continue. So we have the we have the opposite opposite side of that argument, which is you're a horror writer and it's dark times and you're writing dark things. Why would you do that now? Why are you doing this? What kind of person writes a story where there's a dead child? And so there's a moral judgment attached to people who write dark things. And I find that that blurring of this hope punk genre and that morality is like a Venn diagram and there's a part that's very large in the middle and it makes me uncomfortable. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, I have not, I have not experienced that from my perspective, but you know, I mean, that's kind of why I wanted you on here because I think it's important to interrogate these things, you know, and that's why I wanted to talk about this topic specifically. So that's interesting. I'm going to have to keep a, a lookout for that. Now, as far as people trying to, you know, assign morality to writers based on what they write, I, I have definitely seen that before. And that to me is just silly. You know what I mean? It's like, do you know what fiction is? <laughs> no. You know, it's like, it's made up. <laughs> so unless you're actually going around and murdering children, then. I think, I, I think though, sorry, sorry to interrupt yeah. you. I, I think though, if, if you're, if you sort of, and I know you've been to StokerCon and I know you've been, but mm -hmm. there is a, a difference a little bit because I'm in both worlds. I'm in the SFWA and I am in HWA and I hang out in, I, I get to be in both spaces. And I, there is a difference when you're an SFF writer and when you're a horror writer and when you're viewing it. And sometimes if you're a science fiction writer, you might not see what the horror writers are seeing because it's different circles uh -huh. and so sometimes if you're in both you can notice the different points of view going each way sorry to interrupt i just wanted to say that no no i think you're totally right because now now we're talking about how the communities work really and it's funny because most of my like real life friends right like the people i see around pittsburgh or are horror writers slash horror fans, right? And then there's me, like the the odd science fiction fantasy guy who hangs out with them. Uh, and, <laughs> and and they've kind of been dragging me more into the the horror community stuff too. But I totally I I can totally see what you mean, you know. I don't know, you know, maybe we can maybe we can bridge that gap. I, I think one thing that we can talk about though is you know, why do you think horror is hopeful. And, and let me preempt this by saying, I have asked this question of a number of people now, including, including Ellen Datlow, <laughs> who um, told me there's absolutely no hope in horror ever. And if it, there is, then it's not horror. <laughs> uh, that, that's, now that's not an exact quote. I can't remember her exact quote, but it is in one of our podcasts. So if listeners want to hear that, go back and, and listen to the Ellen Datlow uh, interview. But basically she just said, there's no hope in horror and like shut me down on that. But since then, I've been asking other horror writers, perfect example, our last interview, Paul Jessup, completely disagreed with that perspective, you know? So I, I'm very interested to hear what you have to say about it. And, you know, maybe we can change some minds or something. Uh, that's interesting. Ellen Datlow is a giant in the horror field, and she's kind of a tastemaker. Mm -hmm. And she does have, a t I don't want to address Ellen too much, but she does have a particular kind of horror that she likes. And if you read her anthologies, you can get a sense of her taste. There's been a recent conversation about cozy horror or gentle horror mm -hmm. and all these things. And I, I think all of this is also this discussion with us has come about because of that. I kind of want to refer to what I said in the beginning. Horror is a genre about emotions and people always think it's about jump scares mm -hmm. but it the word is horror right it's about being horrified and 
the spectrum of emotions that you can feel is not just the jump scare. It's not just the, you know, slasher or chasing you down the street and, and screaming, you screaming. It's, it's disgust, it's repulsion, it's uh, all those bad things. It's the abject. And so, as what I said in the beginning, it's a way to work out your feelings about something that is upsetting you. And it's funny, Amy said, I found all of your stories at the end kind of hopeful, right? And that's mm -hmm. the point of horror. The, the point of horror, there are, to me, as a writer, two levels. There's the story on the page, right? But there's a meta aspect to horror, and it's about processing feelings. And what scares you or what you bring to the story, yes, that's present in other genres, but horror is really trying to get at your inner feelings about fear or about things that you are anxious about or uncomfortable about. And so that it's a dual thing going on where you're going through the story with the character, but you're also dealing with your own feelings. And so it's that catharsis that when you finish the story and you've processed that on your own and you've sort of survived it, that is the hopeful aspect of it. There's nothing more hopeful than reading something bleak and then to me, coming away from it and saying, yes, that was a horrible thing. And, you know, I can see how that happened in my life and I can see how that plays out elsewhere. And this is what I think about it. And this is how I'm going to deal with, with it later on. That's a very hopeful act. It's not just what the story that's on the page. Horror is beyond what's beyond the page or on the page. This is exactly the reason I like true crime. Because it's a way of like distilling down a bunch of anxiety and a bunch of fear and putting it in this easy to digest bit, right? And then you, once you process this horrible thing, it helps you process the horrible things in your own life. And people, and I know that's a little, it might be a strange analogy. I don't know. But what you're, what you're saying like rings true for that with, for, with that for me too. And I've, and horror to me also is like, it's sort of to me horror has always been like a mood or a a feeling that can infuse almost anything. I know that horror is its own genre and it has its own tropes and its own thing, but horror can be in anything. You're correct. It's the it's the most scalable, it's one of the most scalable genres because horror could be you cut your finger, right? And it gets infected and then your finger falls off and we have to watch that, right? <laughs> right. Or it can be like, you know, the cosmic entity that comes, it, it's the size of the universe that comes in and like makes you insane. So you, you, yes, 100%. Right. There's a horror elements in the fifth element. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's such an interesting, it's such an interesting thing. And it's such a human thing to me that, that need to look right at something that makes you extremely uncomfortable and the absolute fear of doing so. And that those two things, warring is what makes horror and 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 dark fiction and weird fiction so interesting well and and it the world is horrible i'm not going to go into that right now but it's horrific and to me I, I feel like yes you know looking at it kind of allows me to be like as in we were talking about just now okay this exists i'm not going to pretend that it doesn't i because it's happening Mm -hmm. And so let me look at it and it's horrible and I, maybe I won't be able to deal with it, but at least if I can acknowledge it, then we can move forward from there. If I'm not going to look at it, if I, and I'm not saying you, you, you can never take a break. Like you have to be on horror 24 hours a day. Of course you can, you know, read something that's fluff or have a fun time or laugh. But if I'm never going to look at it, then how are we going to move towards anything more truly hopeful in real life? It's like putting things under the rug for me. Right. Because horror is the inverse of the good stuff, right? So you can't like have one without the other, it, which is how I've always looked at it. That reminds me of your story, descaling. And I know there's a word that comes before descaling, and I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. Not looking. It's, it's <laughs> apolopisi. It's a Thank Greek you. word. It's, okay. It's difficult. Yeah. <laughs> but that reminds me of that story because, like, this thing was happening, and no amount of ignoring it 
was going to make it not happen, right? The only way through it was through it. And, you know, that was a situation that sort of demanded attention because it was a very physical thing that was happening. But it, it, the same can be said for any trauma. Just because you don't want to acknowledge it doesn't mean it's not affecting you. I agree. Amy, I think you start bringing in some of the stories. So let's let's segue and, and, and talk a little bit about the stories. And Amy, I think you said something else really interesting that, you know, you felt really hopeful at the end of a lot of Susan's stories. And I can totally see that because, Susan, you have a lot of stories where, like, <laughs> how did I, I, I read? I, my notes say, like, rebelling, leaving. <laughs> And the other one says changing, you know what I mean? Like changing into something better or more true to their self-identity, right? So let's talk about that a little bit. It's funny because a lot of people are on podcasts that I've been on, they, they've said, I'm not a horror reader, but this wasn't too bad. Like, <laughs> this, this wasn't too bad. I can handle, I could handle it for most of it. So yeah, it. I don't think my outlook, I don't write, tend to write stories that are very in a world where everyone dies and there's nothing left, then you die. I mean, that does happen in one, a couple of the stories, but it's, it's not, I, I don't know. I have a bit of compassion in there for the characters, just a bit. Sometimes you definitely do. You definitely do. In fact, <laughs> a funny side story. I messaged you the one time. And and by the way, when this whole thing started, I was like, well, you know, I, I said almost exactly what you're saying. I'm like, I'm not a huge horror fan. I don't like, you know, like extreme horror or whatever they call it now with all the blood and guts and all that kind of stuff. That's a little past my past my zone of comfort. Right. But I read through it and I didn't have any issues with any of the stories, really. And in fact, at, the, at one point I messaged you and I'm like, oh, that guy. Definitely should have gotten, what I say? He should have gotten a rock to the head or no, the shovel to the head. That's what he I He should said. have gotten the shovel to the head. Yeah. See? <laughs> and Susan was like, well, who's the violent one now? <laughs> <laughs> Which I found hysterical. It's funny because not, well, it's not funny, the violence, but the book is quite violent. There's a lot of violence in there, but people seem to like, be like, oh, okay, I can handle this violence. And I'm like, that's because you keep telling yourself that you don't like horror. Because you hear the word horror, and you're like, oh, no, I don't read that. And I'm like, really? Do you really not read it? And then they read it, and then I'm like, see? See? That makes me think of a question. If people are... So a lot of the violence in Skin Thief is domestic violence. And mm -hmm. I wonder if that, if it's easier for people to swallow domestic violence because it's so prevalent and because it's not foreign to their life, right? I wonder if I wonder if there's something about the fact that it's domestic violence that makes it easier to swallow. It could be. It could be that they That's a really interesting question. I've had a couple of people who like reach out to me and say or have have said, you know, I read this and I they were in a a violent situation or they gave it to somebody who was in a violent situation and they they related to it and that mm -hmm. is again related back to the processing issue mm -hmm. right exactly Where it's like you're allowed to to kind of escape or feel sorry for that character or think about how that character should have acted or what they should do in, instead of having to focus on your own Part. So yeah, I think that could be it. I kind of tend to write very inward conflict stories. And right now, since I haven't been writing larger, like political things or things like that, they tend to be domestic because that's been my life a lot. But yeah, I think that's a good point. Going back to the, the characters changing and finding themselves or finding a truer identity, maybe finding themselves is too hopeful, uh, but finding a truer identity you know, it, it seems to me like identity is a really important theme to you personally, but I also feel like identity is an important theme for modern horror in general. And so I bring this up because the last two authors who I talked to who write horror, which were Paul Jessup and Sam, Sam Miller, I don't know if you know either of them. Yeah, I know them. Okay. They both brought up identity in their horror work as well as an important theme. Why do you think identity is so important in horror right now? It just seems to be 
everywhere in that genre? Um, from a slightly different background than I, because I know Paul, we're friends on the social media, and I know I know Sam too. We're we're friends on the social media, so I I I know them both. I come from a sort of different background than them. Right. I wasn't born in North. Well, I was born in the Caribbean, and my family immigrated. And I'm queer, and I was quite closeted for a long time. And I think actually the question is an interesting one. And I have a background in literary theory. And I actually think that horror is not just currently about identity. I think right. horror has always been about identity. I was just thinking about Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair yeah, enough. of course. I mean, horror was started by women. About identity. Uh, <laughs> about identity. About and I how do I how do I distill my thoughts on this? Horror has always been about identity. And it has always been about what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable. And because it's transgressive. And it's the transgressive thing that sort of bridges the boundary between what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable that causes the the sort of discomfort. And that's partly where horror comes from. Not all the time. I'm a big gothic horror fan. So this is why I'm going at it this way. But uh, obviously there are other approaches. And so, yeah, it's not a new thing. It's just that the people who are writing it and who is being centered is... Mm -hmm. it, it has moved the locus of what is what is horrific is is has or is shifting and so like the former objects of horror are now the people who are being centered which is kind of interesting it is and a, a big person who their theory that informs everything i do is this woman called uh i am going to say her name wrong julia kristeva and she wrote about the abject and horror and what do we consider horrific and what we consider horrific and who is the other and the other is always the person that we we def, uh the center the person in the center defines themselves against so all of the things that we don't want about ourselves you know envy jealousy and a lot of my characters have that they're very angry they're jealous they're insecure they have, or they have things about them that society set, used to, or is currently saying is the things that you should not be. Those things are the things you try to push away. And it, let's, for, for example, say we take Dracula, right? Dracula is about identity. It's about an Eastern European count moving towards England. And if you read the book, it's a lot about him coming over there and it sounds like he's corrupting everything. And it's about an attack on the British identity. And so it's just flipped now. It's just everything that I was in the past seen as, and even now to some people, as a corrupting force. I'm a woman. I'm brown. I'm an immigrant. I'm queer. I have many types of neurodiverse things. I have all the things that many people do not want to be. And so I've had to deal with that. I've had to deal with people saying, well, we don't want that kind of person here, or we don't want queer people here, or why are you acting like that? And so it seems like horror has never been about identity, but it always has been about identity. It's just different people writing different identities now. Right. I love that answer. I love that answer. Thanks. Hey, you're welcome. <laughs> I, it's interesting to think that people didn't see that past horror was about identity because the identity that was being protected was theirs i think that's interesting like if you see it from outside if you see something from that's outside yourself it, you're you know you, you have more of a bird's eye view about what it's about i guess and so when you're reading dracula or you're reading frankenstein you identify more with the normal one <laughs> than the monstrous one right yeah the doctor yeah yeah Exactly. And so I think one of the interesting things about Skin Thief is that it it's taking the thing that would normally be the monstrous thing in the other stories and making it making it the the like you said earlier, you're centering this new identity, which is it's a lot more other to a lot more people than or at least people we know than than the ones who are reading Frankenstein. So you wouldn't see the struggle with identity 
in the in the book that reflects your own identity. You only see it in the one that takes you out of yourself. If any of that ramble made any sense. No, it makes complete sense. It's it's taking it and and shaking it up and flipping it over and making that's why at the beginning of the book I wrote, you know, to the monster I was, am and will be, because the monster of the book is me. I'm the scary thing, right? And so it, it is definitely monsters to me are not something that is separate or outside that when you say frankenstein's monster is his creation it's him it's the mirror of him and so a lot of people do identify with the monster they feel bad from it. it's it's a very tragic story for the monster but there are people who see frankenstein who or who used to see dr frankenstein as the hero and being harassed and that perspective has changed or it's or it maybe it hasn't changed, but people are tending to focus now on the monster instead and making the monster human. Yeah. The percep the changing perception of that book is something that always fascinates me. <laughs> I mean, it's stuck around because it because of this, I mean, you know? It's a really rich book. It it really is. I really I really is, like yeah. that book a lot. No, that's that's all very interesting. Gosh, I don't know if I want to talk about monsters next or gothic next, because you're right. You brought up gothic. Let's go gothic. Yes, let's talk about Killjar. <laughs> Susan, you brought up gothic. I'm a huge fan of the gothic. Amy, you want to talk about her her story, Killjar? Let's talk about her story, Killjar. What what would you like to know, Amy? Killjar was one of my top three in this. I mean, there's so much happening in that book that is fascinating to me. But I really wanted to know was what drew you to that particular setting for that particular story. The Victorian setting, or the place, yeah, or the Victorian, like the Victorian setting for this, for this snake woman story. <laughs> it's just so good. <laughs> I did love that story too. I'm really glad people like that story because it's very funny. I wrote it in a month in like 2001 or not 2001, 2021. Wow, that's a 20 years off, Susan. Um, <laughs> Even though 2001 was yesterday, it will always be yesterday. Yes. And I didn't have anyone read it very, like, I didn't, I gave it to one, two people to read, and they just told me what was wrong with it. They were like, this was wrong, ah. that's wrong, this is wrong. So then I fixed that and I put it in the book, and then I haven't really had, I, I haven't really heard anything about it, but people, I'm glad when people like it because. I feel like that Victorian thing, I know you like Frankenstein and I know you did vampire LARPing you mentioned earlier. So <laughs> I know you like Victorian stuff. I, that was your tell from the beginning. I was like, oh, it's my people here. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, my first, uh, I have two first loves and the first one is literary, Canadian literary fiction, short fiction. And then the other one is gothic victorian gothic literature and so i wanted to write a jane eyre but it's not a romance with the dad obviously or with the man but set in that sort of time period because that jane eyre is the book that sort of got me on the gothic i've always been a goth even as a kid but Jane Eyre is one of my favorite books of all time. <laughs> oh, it is. It is the book that has influenced me the most. Fascinating. I and I I love that book so much. I have problems with it. I'm essay about it because I'm I'm obsessed with it, but still love it even though I have difficulties with it. And so <laughs> Oh yeah. No, it's not perfect. Yeah. It's a problematic fave. Oh, no, yes. <laughs> yeah. But chose that period because that's it, that's what I grew up reading. And it was an interesting thing for me because we're talking about, you know, seeing yourself and all of that stuff. And there's a lot of, you know, pale English Victorian <laughs> woman thing going on. And I don't have that myself, but I wanted to write a story like that. So I, tr I wrote one to reflect what I wanted it to reflect. I don't know if that's a really intelligent answer, but that's why. why no, it totally is. I love that answer. It's kind of like when people flip fairy tales, you know, they take them and they turn them into something else to more mm -hmm. closely identify something that resembles our actual lives. And I just, I really like that because there is so much to see in those, you know, old Victorian tales. There's a lot there that is still rel relatable, but it's almost laughable how little there practically is that you find in there that resembles you uh, you know us now 
So I love that idea of taking this thing that you love that's problematic and, you know, molding it into something that is your art. I love that. And I love that it had a snake lady in it. It was wonderful. Oh, yeah. I was going to do a snake. You I love a snake lady, too. You can't do a shit. I was like, I needed one more story. I needed, I needed an unpublished story because almost everything else was published. And I was like, I need an unpublished story. And I'm going to write this. I don't know if you've watched it. The hand was it? Is it the Handmaiden? It's a Korean movie. Oh, I know. I know the movie you're talking about. I have not seen it yet. Yes, I know the movie you're talking about. It's very gay. Um, and I'm, I'm <laughs> <Yeah. right there. laughs> and extremely. Let me warn. I'm not going to warn you because don't warn people about gay things, but because they're good. But it's very gay. And I was like, I want to write something that feels like the Handmaiden, but kind of Victorian and very gay. And then also it has to have a shapeshifter and I don't have a snake and you got to have a snake if you're going to do shapeshifting. I have an important practicality question for you about that story. If Adelaide couldn't touch people without poisoning them, how did the dad and the mom have Adelaide? Because, okay, this is going to be a spoiler. Uh Uh-oh. Okay. So. Wait. Do I not want to know? No, I mean you do want to know because you've read it, but I don't. I don't know if. Oh, spoiler for people who have not read. Right. It. Okay. So people go. for it's going to be like a little spoiler. So in the story, right, the dad keeps giving her this sedative. Yeah. To sleep, right? So mm-hmm. he doesn't touch yep. her, and other people don't touch her, but the sedative is supposed to kind of like numb that, and he gave it to the mom. Um... That that was my that was my world building part. Where it was no, like, this totally makes sense now because she didn't hurt um, the maid girl until after she stopped taking the set of it. Yeah, she was stopping taking it. And it was kind of a, a a much more forceful kind of physical interaction than like, you know, a touch on, the, on the hand or, or whatever. So I kind of conceptualized it as the dad was altering them both to keep them from making people be hurt. I love this. It's just such a good metaphor for, you know, some men like to make women smaller (laughs) so that they can control them. (laughs) And fixing her, right? She has yeah. like, let me yeah. fix you. This this is a problem, and I'm going to fix you. And, and then you should yeah. be happy. I don't understand why you're not happy about this. And he's also afraid of their actual power, which is also another whole nother theme. You know, ah, I love that story. Well, I, I'm okay. glad I, 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 I was about. able to <laughs> explain the technical thing because I got scared there for a moment. I'm like, did I? <laughs> did I, I didn't did mean to cut you out. Did I, I, I knew you mistake? would have an answer. Oh my God. Is there no, I knew you would have an answer. <laughs> no, this is my own reading comprehension failing me. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. That's awesome. We're actually starting to run out of time. So oh, no! this episode is coming out in December. And because it's coming out in December, I kind of felt like, you know, we, we should throw people a bone and do like a, a small list type of thing, right? What, you know, what are a couple of books that you've read this year that you just have loved? I'm going to let you guys go first. <laughs> my list is very short i read a book called tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow which i know a lot of people have read this year but it actually lived up to the hype i thought it was very good i haven't heard of this that's book. a good one what is this book about you should look it up it it's about oh what is this it's about a lot of things on its surface it's about two lifelong friends and their friendship but it's also about the video game industry oh. And family. <laughs> that's what I'll. That's where I'll go with that. Okay. But there's a longer list of books that came out this year that I want to read, and those include Translation State, mm. Deep Sky, God Killer, and Proud Pink Sky. I want to read those four books, and I hope I get to. Oh yeah, I, I just recently read some list with God Killer on it, and I was like, oh, that looks really interesting. That is also on my list. Yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And Proud Pink Sky is about gay sailors, so who wouldn't want to read that? <laughs> is it? Should I go next, or Susan? Do you want to go next? You, you can, you can go because I'm looking up God Killer now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I, I have a tendency to like everything I read for the most part. So probably not the best judge of this necessarily. Also, I read a lot of good classic stuff. So I'm going to leave all the classic stuff out. Some, a few books I've read this year, and they, they didn't all come out this year, but a number of them did. 
The Mountain in the Sea by Ray Naylor, which I just thought was freaking phenomenal. It's about octopuses who have like started developing their own language. Ooh. And it really dives deep into like what is consciousness because you have the humans and then you have the octopuses and then you have one of the characters is like an android. And it really talks a lot about what is consciousness, you know, what, what is what does it mean to be like a living thing or a thinking thing? You know what I mean? And he just does a fantastic job. I love that one. What was the name of it again? The Mountain in the Sea. Ray is a good writer. See, this is why I don't eat cal- calamari. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't eat it because I don't really um, it. Th- those are smart animals. It makes me feel weird. <laughs> For me, it's just mostly because we're vegetarians. <laughs> <laughs> that was an awesome book. Another one was The Unconquerable Sun by Kate Elliott, who, you know, she's been around for a long time. Yeah. And I've never read anything by her. But that, man, that was such an awesome, action-packed book. And just like her work with the like the political factions and her world building and everything just phenomenal absolutely loved it loved it i think what they what they've been saying about that book is that it's the gender flipped alexander the great story so think about that way also in space ooh i just remembered a good one if you want to talk about dark stuff one of the best books i read this year was called ravensbrook and it was about the women's concentration camp that was the only like all women's concentration camp it was heavy stuff, but it was a really good book. Hmm. Ooh, that does sound heavy. It was heavy, <laughs> but it was very good. I do have a horror, I guess it's called, I guess it's considered a horror novel, but I would have called it like, I don't know, dark fantasy maybe, but maybe I'm just splitting hairs here. A Dance for the Dead by Nuzo Ono. As longtime listeners know, I'm a huge Nuzo Ono fan. I just love all of her work. It's just, I just think she does a fantastic job. And it's also a pretty good satire of, I would say like toxic masculinity or maybe just masculinity in general. And I'll give you a brief, brief synopsis here. There's a king and he's got two sons. One of the sons is like a, a ne'er-do-well, if you will. He's just like drunk all the time and goofing off. And uh, the king's like insists that he gets married. And instead of getting married, you know, he like gets his friend and, and they go and they cause some trouble. And anyway, like, you know, they end up going to like the underworld and like all this shit happens and there's like some absurd moments in it, but there's also like zombies and demons and, you know, people being hacked up and stuff. And, and also it takes place in a completely different culture than I'm used to reading things in, which is also something that I really enjoy is like learning about different cultures, you know, through reading fiction by those people. Uh, I shouldn't say those people, by by people from those cultures <laughs> is what I mean. Yeah, I, that, that sounded bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean it that way. And then the last one I will list, and this is a, an old book. I think this was written in the 70s or the 80s, or the early 80s maybe. It was It's called Charmed Life by Diane Wynne-Jones, part of the Crestomancy series. The reason I love it is because I just picked it up like on a whim. Like it was like this fat double volume book, you know what I mean? And I'm like, oh, it's like aged appropriately for my kid, you know, well, I'll read it to him. And I've never read anything by her before. And, you know, my kid doesn't know anything by her. And, you know, we've been reading like Neil Gaiman. We read, uh, I don't know. So, uh, we've been reading like all these fantasy series because he's a big fantasy reader, right? And so I finally insisted that we had to read this book. I'm like, look, this book's been sitting here forever. We got to read it. And he's like, oh, fine, whatever. And guess what his favorite book is now? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I just, I just love it because he loves it so much. And it was just like surprise out of nowhere. You know what I mean? Just to give a a brief synopsis. It's about this kid, his sister's a witch and she's very powerful with magic. And this other very powerful magician becomes interested in her and invites them both to come to his castle and they go to his castle so he can like teach her magic. Right. But then surprises ensue, let's say, and it's just like really like, I don't know. I guess they probably call it cozy these days because like it's not like like no one really gets hurt. You know what I mean? There's not like a lot of violence or anything. It's, it's pretty a pretty chill book, but it's also super fun and super imaginative too. Is it hope punk? Is it hopeful? <laughs> um, yeah. Is it hope punk? Is it a hope punk book? I mean, I I don't know. I, I think for me, probably not really. I mean, they're not really pushing back on anything in that book. So I would say, I would say no, okay. not in my opinion. 
to kind of circle back to the beginning just a little bit, since you asked that question, you know, I, I agree uh, people's definitions of what that means is different. And it's interesting bringing you on, and I shouldn't just say you, but all all the authors that we brought on who write horror and talking about hope and horror, because this, the question about whether horror can be hopeful was brought up in literally our second episode of all time. It's just interesting to keep exploring it. But I do think different people have different definitions of that. And that's okay. You know, all right, that's enough of me rambling. Go ahead, Susan. I haven't read a ton of books this year. And the books I've read have all been indie horror. So I don't have a long list, but there is one book that a novella that I really enjoyed called Sleep Alone by J.A.W. McCarthy. And you ever you ever read a book and you're like, oh, this 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 is so good. And then you stay up all night and you finish the book Mm -hmm. and then you're so sad because it's over. You're sad. You're yes. sad because it's over. So sad. Yes. And you wanted that feeling to continue. And, you know, it's so funny because this book, right? It's about a succubus who is a, like the manager or like roadie for a punk band. <laughs> and <laughs> that's awesome. And they go around <laughs> and, you know, they tour different places and, but she's a succubus, so, you know, you can't really hang around in places too long because things happen. Right, and right. And it's so funny because everyone is always talking about cozy and, like, you know, people are dying and it's and bleeding out and all kinds of things. But the book felt so cozy to me and I really enjoyed it. <laughs> That's awesome. Like, I just love that book. And was it, like, you know, huge? It was a very, per- like, we were talking about things I write sort of being very domestic and very personal and very like it felt like that. I, I just really enjoyed this this succubus draining people book. So that was called Sleep Alone. Awesome. There was another one I had in my brain and now my brain is shutting down so I can't remember. But I'm currently finishing Eden Royce's collection which is called Who Lost I Found. And she writes, she's from the Gullah Geechee area of the United States, which is like a very specific. Oh, that's my people. I mean, not my people, but that's my area. Yeah. yeah. And so probably. That's where I'm from, down down there in that coastal area. Oh, okay. We have a lot in common, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> we like the same things. What was the name of that book? So. It's a collection, and uh, usually uh, Eden writes middle grade, but this is called Who Lost I Found. And I cannot remember the publisher, but it's very indie pop, this one. And it's about that culture, and then it's about, like, how do I describe this? It's that culture, and it's very, like, I don't want conjure women and tobacco fields. And, oh, my gosh, that's so good. <laughs> and and things like that and it's very mythical the stories are very mythical so i'm finishing that i love eden so uh, just generally so everything she writes i read but this i'm finishing off and i i like the feel of that so i'm just gonna go with those two awesome awesome thank you i want to say that i actually read something by jaw mccarthy this year as well which which i also enjoyed although it, it definitely pushed my boundaries as far as gore goes because it was extremely gory Ooh. What did you read? She's my friend. Oh, really? Uh, Imigo Expulsio, the the red animal of our blood. Oh, I did not read. That. Oh, it's good. It's good. Uh, it's uh, it was in Split Screen Volume Three, and both stories are really good. She she writes a bit more viscor horror than I do, I believe, but I enjoy her a lot. Well, I mean, I don't have a lot to go on, but based on the one story, yes, she definitely much more gore than than yours. But it was an excellent story. So everyone go check out Split Screen Volume 3, too. Very cool. I was sitting here trying to think of the last book I read that gave me that can't get out of bed, need to sit in this bed and finish the book feeling. And I remembered it was my, my a friend of mine named Liz Lawson wrote a book called The Agathas with her friend Kathleen. It's like a it's a it's a young adult mystery. It's so good. And there's a sequel now, I believe. So I just wanted to plug that. It, it's it's really, really good. The Agathas. The Agathas? See, every book. Yeah, you're me- every book you're mentioning, I'm like looking it up because I need books that make me feel that feeling. And it's it's like I think there are a lot of good books out of out there, but that feeling I'm always chasing. 
Oh yeah. That's the high. <laughs> yeah. That's the, that's the dream. Sure. And th- it's few and far between, you know, and I think it's such a gift. It's such a gift when it happens, you know? And unexpected too, sometimes. Mm-hmm. Cause I yeah. didn't expect that. And I was like, Oh, Oh, okay. We're doing yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Okay. Okay. We got to wrap this thing up. So Susan could go have a life. I have to ask you our final question. Our final question is, what is bringing you hope right now? I'm a pretty dark person and a goth. So a lot of the time, I I, I don't mind being in the dark and feeling dark and, and despair and all of those things. But I try to focus on things I can do. So, you know, every day I think, okay, well, there are a lot of bad things in the world and there are a lot of things going on, but I can do things to make things better. And so, you know, I try to like, for example, I'm going to plug something. Sure. I just helped put out or edit a Caribbean issue for Strange Horizons. And like that, it's not about me, right? I don't, I, I, it's not about like me being able to put it together. It was about, I helped get these writers published and I want people to read their stories. So like things like that, like, being seeing people trying to do small things or like even trying to help or make awareness about anything that helps people makes me hopeful. I can very much relate to that. I mean, that's a big part of our mission on this podcast for sure. So yes, totally understand that. Thanks for that answer though. Thank you. All right. And then do you have any more projects that you want to talk about that'll be coming out soon? I know you mentioned in your intro, you've got a a novella called Countess coming out in 2024. And I also believe you mentioned a a space opera. Are you allowed to talk about that at all? Countess is a space opera. Oh, it is the space opera. It is the the space opera. Yeah, it is. Count of Monte Cristo, Caribbean Count of Monte Cristo, queer in space. This is amazing. <laughs> it's uh, it's not like anything in this collection. I mean, it, there are uh, dark moments and it's emotional. Like it has that to me, but it's like there's a, there's space chases and there's a love thing and betrayal and pi- space pirates. I don't know what happened to me while I wrote that. I was in a different personality. <laughs> You went into a fugue state and then you came out with this. I did. I did. I wrote it in six weeks. And I was like, oh, I love this. But I love Count of Monte Cristo. So that's where that came from. And it's coming out hopefully in the fall. I am working on the edits right now. I have to hand them in next week. Exciting. That's awesome. I will definitely be looking for that. There are short stories and stuff, but I won't won't go into those things. (laughs) I don't know when they're coming out. Can you tell us like what magazines they'll be in? No, well, some of them are are they're mostly anthologies. I've I've had an interesting year because mm. I used to write stories and submit them to the magazines and and you know they you can see them on the list you read there. But they've they're all in anthologies. So one of them is Crawling Moon from it's from Neon Hemlock as well, and it's <laughs> this one is. I forget the tagline for it, but it's queer horror, but it's very, very queer and very explicit. And I kind of was embarrassed to write it. And I wrote it and I was like, Dave, I don't know, this this is like porn. Are you okay with this? And he was like, yeah, give it to me. So I wrote some SFF porn and sent it to him. So that's coming out. See why I didn't want to talk about this? (laughs) I'm sorry, should I cut this part? (laughs) No, it's fine. It's fine. But yeah, stuff like that. It's it's uh, the Crawling Moon anthology. It's coming out next year, and there are others. But I, I can't, the names escape me, and and the dates. Oh, why didn't you just leave with uh, Nadia Balkin and Julia Rios? They edited it. That that's a haunted house anthology, but it's a haunted house anthology where it's like, why didn't you just leave the house? And the story start yes. explains why the person can't leave. Oh my god, I'm so excited about this. I looked it up as you were talking. This looks great. <laughs> I saw the Kickstarter for that one and man. So I've mentioned before, this has been a pretty rough year for me and finances have been part of it. And and I promised myself no more Kickstarters and I, ha- I had to watch it come and go and I was so sad. So hopefully I'll be able to get it later on, you know, like after we're after the Kickstarter and stuff. Cause that did look cool. I saw that too. And I love, I love ghost stories. 
especially haunted house stories? Oh, this is a ghost story. It's a it's a very flipped ghost story. I, I can give you a bit of detail. It's about a woman who is working for someone, but she has a work visa and she has to work for that person. So it's like, well, how can you leave if you're if you leave that space, then you will be undocumented. Mm -hmm. It's and how do you deal with that? That's what the story is about. Love it. Love it. You know, I should ask you, what is bringing you hope right now too, Amy? And also, what is Hugo Girl up to now that you guys have won? Or I shouldn't say you guys. I am so sorry. Now that you all have oh, okay. won a Hugo. Uh, well, we're going to Disneyland. No, just kidding. <laughs> I mean, we're just going to keep kicking out the same quality programming that our public has come to expect, Alan. That's our plan. All right. All right. Oh, yeah. And all your listeners should. Uh, we, we publish our podcast monthly, wherever you get your podcast. Go look us up. Hugo Girl. What is giving me hope right now? You know what? I always get hope. Whenever things are bleakest, I always go back to Mr. Rogers. And Mr. Rogers very famously taught us, don't look at the bad part, look at the helpers. And so even when things are the worst, there are always people trying to make things better. And that always gives me hope. Great, great. Thank you. And then the last thing, of course, I know you mentioned your Instagram at the top of the podcast that is Gothic Syntax. Do you want to mention any of your other social media or do you just want to leave it with Instagram? Yeah, let's just leave it with Instagram because I like I'm on Twitter, but I I don't I don't want to encourage people <laughs> to hang out there. If they don't <laughs> want to be there. Like I'm on Blue Sky too, and that's silly syntax. And you can find me on my website, and I think that's susanpalumbo.wordpress. But yeah, I mean you'll find me if you just write Susan Palumbo on the internet, and it comes up. I'm there. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. It's been awesome talking to you about all this stuff. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Thank you for allowing me to rant. I really felt that I did some ranting there. And I, <laughs> I, I, I thank you for listening and not being like too scared of my ranting or whatever, whatever we want to no. call it. It was really nice to actually get to talk to people who, you know, will listen about it. I found it to be riveting ranting. You were a great co-host. Oh, thank you. Amy. <laughs> Appreciate that. She was, wasn't she? Okay. And so that was our discussion with Susan Palumbo. If you've been wondering how you can support us, please go out and rate and review us. Pass us on to a friend on Facebook or Blue Sky or whatever social media you are using these days. Those are really the best things that you can do for us. If you really like what we're doing, we have a Patreon. You can check that out at patreon.com slash if this goes on. And we also have a coffee account that's KOFI and you can just put it in the search bar and we'll pop right up if you don't want to do like a long-term support type of thing like Patreon and just want to shoot us a couple bucks, you know, one time. Amy, what are you thinking about the interview? Like uh, what, what's stuck in your brain? Well, that was just so edifying and delightful. Isn't she lovely? Yes. I think my favorite part I like the conversation about identity and horror. I think that there's a lot there that we could have kept, continued to talk about, I think. For sure. And and how, you know, because even like the formation of identity can be a traumatic event. And that's like at the very core of how she writes. And I just thought that conversation was extremely interesting, especially when we started talking about how it goes all the way back. Yeah. I'm going to reread every horror book and think about identity now. Yeah, yeah. I had a thought too. We kind of discussed this briefly with Paul Jessup, he had mentioned that a lot of the horror that, you know, like I grew up with, and I don't know how old you are, but if you are in like maybe your late thirties, mid forties in that range, like I am, you know, you probably grew up with like Dean Coons and Stephen King and all this kind of stuff. Right. And it's right. all that mainstream, like white guy, you know, cis white guy kind of focus, you know what I mean? And, you know, so I, I knew exactly what she was talking about, you know, from that perspective. And that's the horror that I read last. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I really haven't read a ton of horror since those days until, gosh, I don't know, the last year, you know, probably with the podcast is it can't go on forever. You know what I mean? It's like we had so <laughs> many, so many ideas to talk about and so many things I wanted to chat and hit on before we, we got to the end. But yeah, I mean, we could have probably talked about the 
that for the entire podcast, you know? Was that too rambly there? No. <laughs> I was kind of all over the place. I think my meds wore off. <laughs> <laughs> That's going on my gravestone. <laughs> I think my meds wore off. <laughs> I think my meds wore off. <laughs> Here lies Amy. Her meds wore off. <laughs> uh, I, I do wish we could have gotten to talk about some of the monsters because she has some really cool monsters in her stories. She had good monsters. She did. You know, and I liked the one with the tessellated skin. That was so cool. Yeah, yeah. That's the number one on my list that I wanted to talk about. And gosh, by the yeah, time you got really to, good. around to that, it was like the time is counting down. And I'm like, okay, we got to keep going. But if we ever get her back on. I wanted to talk to her about that one. And I wanted to talk to her about the reincarnation one. I really liked the reincarnation one. Which one was the reincarnation? Was that the... Uh, I forget what it was called. Peonies. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. The Peonies one. Yeah, that one was really good. Anyway, they, they were all good. The one positive thing about not talking about the monsters is I did not embarrass myself trying to <laughs> trying to pronounce their name. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no we would have failed. <laughs> totally, totally, 100%. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so w- what are you reading right now? Right now I'm in the middle of two books. I am reading The Lord of Light by Zelazny for oh. the podcast. And uh-huh. I must admit at the moment I'm struggling a bit with it. Um, really? But I think I'm finally getting the hang of what he's trying to do so maybe it'll go smoother now <laughs> but it was it was a tough for me in the beginning but you can learn more about that on our next episode my other book that i'm reading is a book about waco <laughs> the branch davidian tragedy in waco like 25 years ago or whatever 35 years ago yeah it's a. Uh, remember that being on i'm TV? fascinated by cults so it's been it's a it's it's up my alley yeah cults are kind of fascinating but I want to go back to I want to go back to the Selesny for a minute. Have you have you ever read anything else by him? No, this is my first Selesny. Interesting, interesting. I have not read that one. <laughs> is it, is it, go ahead. No, I was going to ask you if you'd read it. I was going to ask you how it stacked up. But no, I have not read it. But I know a lot of people that love that book. I have read, however, I have read. Oh gosh, I'm forgetting the name of the series. He has he has like a ten book series. I I've read the whole thing. The books are very short though. They were like 120 pages or something. So you could just zip through them really fast. Oh, Amber, that's what they're called. Amber Chronicles. That's the name of the Amber Chronicles. They're all over the place. The first one was written in the 60s. The last one was written in the 90s. I think I have a different opinion on like literally every single one in that series. <laughs> from from wow, that was garbage. How did that get published? To that was. <laughs> Pretty excellent, you know? <laughs> I mean, I guess it's bound to happen, you know, when you put out a lot. Some of it's going to land and some of it's not. <laughs> right, right. So inter- I'll be interested to hear what you all have to say about that. I will definitely be listening to that episode of your podcast. As I'm sure it will be hilarious as always. <laughs> oh, here's for hoping. Let's see, what am I reading right now? So I am reading the two brand new books, A, a Haunting on the Hill by Elizabeth Hand, which is kind of like a... It's, I guess we'll call it a sequel to the uh, Shirley Jackson book, um, A Haunting of Hill House. Uh huh. I mean, I'm only like, I don't know, 50 pages in maybe, probably not even that far, probably like 40 pages in. I, I say probably because I'm actually listening to that one. So far, so good. I've never read anything by Elizabeth Hand. I've always wanted to read something by her because I hear nothing but fantastic things. But then recently I read like a, a review of the book that was kind of like, meh. And I'm like, oh man, I hope it's. I hope it's better than that. <laughs> eh, you can't, you can only give, you can only listen to reviews so far. You know what I mean? Fair enough. Everybody's fair talking. enough. Totally true. Totally true. And, and I will say, I just finished reading The Haunting of Hill House for the first time right before this book. So I'm kind of I enjoying love that book so much. Oh, do oh. you? You've read it? Oh, yeah. I love that book. Have you read They, they Always Live in the ca- They've Always Lived in the Castle? Yeah. Which one did you prefer? I read them at very different times in my life. So that's a tough question. I think, I think hunting of Hill House. Interesting. Interesting. I'm, I don't know. I I've been thinking about this a lot lately for some reason, my brain just keeps like, which one do I like better? And I kind of think I like they've, we've always lived in the castle better than haunting of Hill House. It's tough. I mean, I think they're both very good. So. Oh, that. Yeah, they're both excellent. She was a different writer also by the time she wrote We Have Always Lived in the Castle. I don't know. It's just tough. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, phenomenal characters, phenomenal. Both of them are phenomenal. Definitely everybody should go out and read those. And then the other book I'm reading is 
my wonderful co-host, Cat Rambo's new book, Devil's Gun. And I'm also like Ooh, 20 pages into that book. So I don't really have <laughs> any opinions on it yet. But I would have to say only good stuff anyway, because it's Cat's book. So I mean, yeah, you can never tell her what you really think. Cat, <laughs> <laughs> don't listen to this episode. <laughs> I do really, I did really enjoy her her first novel in this series, and I actually, and I've read all of Cat's long fiction at this point, and the first novel in the series was my favorite book that she's written, aside from the novella she won the Nebula for. Well, must must she must have done something good in it? Oh yeah, she won the Nebula. <laughs> that one, that's such a fun one. It was about like this relative who dies and they're like a hoarder. Oh God, I can't remember. Maybe it was the granddaughter maybe or something like that. Or the, the niece kind of goes in and like starts going through it and, you know, antics ensue. It was kind of creepy. I don't know if it ever got scary, but it definitely had like some, some creepiness to it. And it was kind of, there was some magic in it. It was, it was, it was super fun. It was super fun. But to go back to Devil's Gun, the first book in the series was just, you know, it's an action adventure kind of thing. Really fun characters, you know, only 20 pages into Devil's Guns. Can't tell you about that yet, but that's what I am reading right now. So, okay. So I guess it's time to wrap this thing up, huh? All right. So thank you again for coming on to be be my co-host. I really appreciate it. And Well, uh, thanks for asking me. It's been great. Yeah, yeah. Just excited that you you said yes. To everybody out there, we will see you again soon. Thanks for your support. We're keeping hope alive one episode at a time. If this Goes On, Don't Panic is edited by Alan Bailey and produced by Ken Schrader. Our theme music is by Father Flamethrower. Additional music is by Christopher Sidrowski. And outro music is by Sable Aradia. Intro by Dave Robison. A special thanks to our guest, Susan Palumbo, and our guest co-host, Amy Sally. Thanks for supporting us, and we'll see you again soon.